Hey everybody, let's get up on our feet. Let's get ready for worship. It's great to see everybody. Sing joy to the world. i 
worship with me this morning as we set our hearts and our minds on the coming of the Messiah and celebrating his birth, the Savior that came to save, who resurrected, died for our sins so that we can have eternal life with him someday. Let's worship today in thanksgiving, in gratefulness, in praise, pouring out of a heart of worship. Will you say this with me as we set our minds on Christ? God of salvation, you straighten the winding ways of our heart and smooth the paths made rough by sin. Keep our conduct blameless. Keep our hearts watchful in holiness and bring to perfection the good you have begun in us, whose day draws near your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. May he be magnified this morning as we sing. Suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry from north to south and east to west. We'd hear Christ be magnified. And were the whole
can know you, uh, the light of the world, Lord, and we celebrate your coming and you becoming man in the incarnation of, of the Messiah um, to be the savior of the world. What joy, what amazing grace, Lord. We just thank you that we can come together and, and freely worship you and, and raise our voices to honor you and to extol your name, Lord. And we just uh, ask your, your blessing over this time, Lord, over the, the fellowship, over the, the giving, over the song and prayer preaching of the word, Lord, that your name would be glorified. And Lord, we just ask a special blessing for those who are suffering right now here or uh, at home, and Lord, that you would uh, make your presence very known uh, to them, that you might give them a peace that passes all understanding and a real joy in the 
middle of all the turmoil and, and that there is here on, on earth. And Lord, we just ask your, your special blessing upon us now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Why don't you get around and say hello to someone you don't know and have a time of fellowship? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Uh, if you could find your seats. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, welcome to Hope Chapel. Uh, welcome to the Christmas season. Uh, we have things going on during the week that if you'd like to get involved with, uh, you can. On Monday night, there's a marriage group. Um, on Tuesday night, there's a men's group here. Uh, get involved with that. On Thursday night, there's a women's group. On Saturday morning, there's a special Bible study called HIT. We spend about two hours. It's a little deeper. That's from 8 to 10 o'clock. Jaime has a uh, Bible study in Spanish online. Um, so that's getting. And we have two announcements, really special announcements for December. Um, the, our big event is coming. And we've done this uh, kind of annually over the years. It's our Christmas Wonderland. It's Friday, December 16th at 6 p.m. Um, that's when we actually get snow. Um, we bring snow in and we make a slide and the kids slide down and, and we have uh, bounce houses and it's outside, we have a bonfire if it's, and it's really a fun time. It's a time you can invite your entire family, your friends, neighbors, and we just hang out on the lawn, um, but it's really fun. The pictures are great. Um, adults go down the slide, uh, the, the snow, um, it's really fun. So um, mark your date for that, that's the 16th. And then the other important date is uh, on the December 25th, we will have church. Um, it is, it, I know it's busy and you're opening presents and all that, but if we don't show up on Christmas when it's on Christmas, then there's something wrong. So we're going to have it. Um, we'll have a, a, a time here. We're going to have some food in the back. Um, so come and we're going to kind of have a little buffet there and everyone who, who shows up will just spend some time together uh, here on Christmas morning. Okay, um, without uh, any further ado, I'll ask the ushers to come forward and uh, we'll take our morning offering. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time, there's no obligation, uh, but this is uh, our uh, giving back to God. It is an act of worship and, and God, the only thing he requires is a cheerful giver. Um, but he says, test me in this and, and give of, of, to him uh, the first fruits and uh, he will bless. So let's have a word of prayer and, and we'll uh, take our morning offering. Heavenly Father, thank you. We thank you for blessing upon blessing. And, and your word says all good things come from above. And Lord, you are the sustainer, the provider, and the giver of all things, Lord. And we recognize that right now, that we, we owe you. Uh, your faithfulness is ever ending and we, there's no way we can pay you back. And you've asked us to give to your church that, you, that the church might be that instrument that proclaims the good news of the gospel here in Miami and throughout the world, Lord. And we just ask that we as your people would be the, the people of God you've called us to be. Um, help us to be good stewards of your money. And Lord, we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Again, good morning. It's a great joy to be here today. And before we get to the preaching and the word, we are going to do a little bit of uh, polity and church uh, business. About a month ago, uh, we had a congregational meeting here. All members were invited. We had given two weeks of anticipation for that. And at that meeting, we, uh, we talked about the importance of deacons. And uh, we haven't had deacons here uh, for a long time, and it is biblical that you have elders and deacons. And, and deacons came about in, in, in Acts, um, what was happening, the, the apostles were praying and, and preaching and doing their things, and there was uh, a little conflict between the widows, and the widows were asking for money and, they didn't, or, and food, and, and they weren't really being taken care of. And uh, so th they said, we need some help, and so they found uh, men who were full of the Holy Spirit and uh, put them to work to take care of the, me the, the physical needs of the people. And so uh, we believe, uh, as our church polity, that there's two uh, officers in the church. We believe that there's elders and there's deacons. And today we're, uh, we voted on uh, two men um, who are going to come before us today and uh, we will... Uh, ordain them, which means we will, uh, they'll take a vow, um, we'll lay hands on them, and then they will be uh, deacons of our church. Now, I, I explained this in the other meeting. Um, we, we decided to bring up these two men first. In men's group, I'm training, there have been men who have been acting as deacons for a very long time here, and I do not want to uh, belittle what they've done. Um, they know who they are, they know the service and how they've taken care of people. And so what we're doing in men's group is that we're training up the rest of the elders, and you'll, you'll see why in a sec, I mean, the rest of the deacons. And we hope that in January, um, we will add to their number. Um, but when, to become a deacon, we have to make sure that we're all in line theologically and, and, and that you're ready to take the vows. And so we're, we're in that process. And I'm going to call the two men up uh, right now and introduce them. Uh, Mike and David, if you'd come up. Now, you could say, why Mike and David? Um, well, first of all, um, they've held uh, positions of this kind before. Um, Mike was actually the head of the deacon, deaconship at Old Cutler Presbyterian for a long time. Um, and so he has experience in this. And by his gray hair, he has more experience than I do. Um, and uh, he, uh, he, he's a real asset to help us. Um, bring on new uh, deacons and really uh, show them the rope. He, he's been involved for almost 10 years with uh, the homeless ministry downtown, uh, feeding the homeless and preaching the gospel to him. And so he comes with a boatload of experience and love. And uh, I, I think it's a, a great way of helping us um, really bring in uh, the, the, the newer uh, men, the younger men, because he'll tell you that he's, he's not going to be the, the one carrying everything anymore. We need the young guys to step up, um, but we, we also need to learn from our elders. And so that's, uh, Mike's here um, with that. And the other one is David Metter. I've known David Metter for about 16 years now. Um, he hired me. Um, and uh, since then, honestly, and this is kind of crazy, but we've Every working day, we've probably had coffee together for the past 16 years. And uh, he is in line with our, our, uh, our theology. He has uh, uh, partaken in, and held offices in another church. And he brings administrative and uh, really spiritual balance um, to us. And they, so we're going to ordain these two men. Um, and like I said, um, not belittling what our men have done um, and I could name them, but you'll see them in a month or so. Um, but we're, we're bringing these two on first as the, the start, and then we're going to bring on our, our other men. Okay? So let me just read this paragraph from the, the, the Book of Church Order. It says, The duty of the deacon is to minister to those who are in need, to sick, and to the friendless, and to any who are in distress. It is their duty also to develop a grace of liberality in the membership of the church, to devise effective methods of gifts and giving, to distribute the gifts among the, uh, the people who are in need. Um, they shall care for the property of the congregation, both real and personal, and they shall keep proper repair of the church uh, building uh, belonging to the congregation. Congregation, And in a matter of special importance, um, they will uh, work towards our unity and purity here at Hope 
chapel. And so that's kind of what they're called to do. Um, now, I have uh, a couple questions I'll ask them. There's six of them. And uh, these are the six vows that every deacon uh, must take. So uh, th the first one is, and, and you can hold off saying yes until all of them, I guess. Um, no, we'll do, no, we should do each and every one. Um, uh, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament as originally given to be the inerrant word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? And do you further promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the fundamentals of our system of doctrine, you will, on your own initiative, make known to the session and cha the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? Do you approve of the form of government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America and in conformity with the general principles of biblical polity? Do you accept the office of, of uh, deacon as the case may uh, in this church and promise faithfully to perform all the duties thereof to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your life and to set a worthy example before the church of which God has made you an officer? Do you promise subjection to your brethren in the Lord? Do you promise to strive for the purity, peace, and unity, and the edification of the church? Yes. Um, now we'll, we'll do this. Um, we've done this, and it's just a formality, but I'll do it now as well because they've already been voted in. But do you, the members of the church, acknowledge and receive these brothers as deacons, and do you promise to yield to them all the honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which this office, according to the word of God and the constitution of the church, entitles them? Okay, so uh, now what we'll, we'll do is um, I'll ask the, the session to come up, John and Jaime, and we will gather around them and we'll lay hands on them. And this is what was done in the Old Testament church. And the, the hands get heavy. Um, and so what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll pray. And, and you pray along with us. If you want to put out your hand in, in symbol, you can. But this is, this is really a, a passing of authority as we lay hands on, him, on them. And this is a real, just so you know, it's, I've been here 20 years. And this is the first time we've had deacons. And so this is a really important time uh, in the life of our church. And I expect God to bless it. And uh, it's, it's going to help us grow. It's going to grow spiritually and, and in numbers and take care of the people that God has uh, given to us. So um, pray, pray with us. Heavenly Father, we just ask now uh, your blessing over Mike and David, Lord, you have called them to this. Um, you have put them in this position. Uh, you have given them the gifts and talents um, over the years. Lord, we, we thank you for their experience and their knowledge and uh, their love for you. And Lord, right now we ask your blessing upon them and their families that they might uh, be men of courage, full of the Holy Spirit, discerning uh, the needs of our congregation and without hesitation uh, moving to uh, console and uh, exhort and to love our people. And Lord, we just ask your blessing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, this is kind of crazy. It's not a secret handshake, but we give them the right hand of the fellowship. And so we shake hands with them. I don't know why, but that's the formal thing we do. Um, and now I, there's a pronouncement. There's a pronouncement. So I say, I now pronounce and declare that Mike uh, and David have been regularly elected, ordained, and installed a ruling elder. I mean, I, I'm sorry, a deacon in this church, agreeable with the word of God and according to the constitution of the Presbyterian Church in America. And that as such is entitled to all encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, gentlemen. So like I said, once we uh, finish our, our men's group going over the Book of Church order with our guys and going over uh, the Westminster Confession and the Shorter Catechism so that they will be able to say honestly and sincerely yes to the vows, we will be having more deacons um, become deacons. Okay? Uh, let me put this down here so I don't... 
Okay. Let's have a word of prayer before we get to our word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, what you're doing here at Hope Chapel. And Lord, we just ask for the next couple minutes that you uh, speak to us, that you uh, really, through the power of the Holy Spirit, kind of shake us up, um, that you'd fill our hearts with joy, that we would know you in a, in a deeper way uh, that would change the way we see the world and the way we see others and the way we see Christmas, Lord, that you would... Uh, uh, work in our hearts, work in our families, uh, unite us uh, under uh, your power and what you've done, your gospel and your good news, Lord. And we ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. We're, like I said, we've been celebrating Christmas. Last week, we talked about celebrating Christmas every day. And I talked about the Puritans who wanted to cancel Christmas because it wasn't really effectual in their lives. And, and I didn't want to cancel Christmas. I want to practice Christmas every day. And we talked about the coming of Jesus. And we, we took a, uh, we based our sermon on Isaiah chapter 9. Um, and it's that famous uh, verse, chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in the land, deep darkness. On them a light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy, and they rejoice before you as with joy of the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoils. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Median. And for every boat, boot that's of the trampling warrior in the battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire." For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he in his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over the kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It's amazing, but, but if we understand the word of God, Christmas should be celebrated every day because the guy who comes, Jesus, establishes his kingdom and his authority on earth. So today I want to look specifically at verse 3, and we're going to talk about joy today. It says, you have multiplied the nation and you have increased its joy, and they rejoice before you as with joy of the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoils. In Luke chapter 2, you know, the, the angels come down, and we just sang about, you know, joy to the world. All right, but in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he, he brings it into, uh, into the Christmas story. And he says in Luke chapter 2, And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you this day to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. How's your joy? That's the question. All right? Because, it, you know, I, we, we mentioned that this is a happy season, but for a lot of people it's not. For a lot of people it's not the happy season. All right? And, and, and we've got to ask the question, why? I, I looked up the word uh, joy in the dictionary uh, because I like the word, because, you know, words have meaning. And we can't just put our own meaning to words. But this is the definition for joy. The emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. That's joy. The emotion evoked by well-being, success, good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. Christmas joy. He says it's a great joy. And if, if my concept works through it, if, if great joy has come in Jesus and Jesus is now here, then that great joy has to carry itself through our lives. And remember, our, our whole idea is that we've got to live a, Chris, a Christmas life. And now, John, 
Um, and I really didn't want to stop going through John or we'll never get through there. And, and the more I read John, the more I see it's Christmas everywhere. Um, and, and I was reading the, the portion from Isaiah, but if you, we go to the end of chapter uh, 3, I'm just going to read five verses. This is John speaking. Now, John was baptizing, and, and uh, Jesus and his di- disciples were baptizing, and a lot more people were going to Jesus. And uh, this was before John was uh, arrested and before he was going to be beheaded. Um, But this is the the conversation that happens. It says, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to them, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all of them are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one, uh, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. There is, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. It's a great verse. You know, if you want to know who your friend is, if you have success, they'll help you celebrate. Do you hear what I just said? If you want to know who your truly your good friend is, if you have success in life, the true friend will celebrate with you. He won't make it about himself. He won't make excuses. He won't do anything. He won't belittle it. He'll celebrate. He'll exalt it. And and John knows. And he says, listen, this is the way it's supposed to be. Jesus is growing. His government is growing. His authority is growing. People are going to him. And my joy is what? Complete. It wasn't about who? John. And see, I think we, we miss this um, because we try to make joy about ourselves, right? And if you look at our definition again, it says the emotion evoked by well-being. So he said, oh, am I, am I okay? Uh, and my success, uh, did, I, did I perform? Did I get enough success? Or my good fortune? And we make our, our joy about what we do. And John, uh, John the Baptist says, my joy is complete because of what Jesus is doing. Now, it's crazy. I looked up the the antonym of joy. um, And there's 88 of them. I'm not going to read all 88. But unhappy, miserable, sad, depressed, sorrowful, glum. I like that one. Upset, cheerless. And the last one I wrote down was droopy. All right. You know Eeyore? You know, the, the, right, droopy, all right? And then there's 88 other ones, all right? Um, what's the difference be, between well-being and, and John's attitude and all these other words that I've talked to? And, and I, I think there's just one simple answer, and please listen to me. Do you believe Truly believe the word of God. That's the answer. I'll never forget, um, and I don't know, it's been three, four, four years ago. I went kind of through a tough time, and I, I remember sitting by myself. And I've been a pastor for many years, and I know the Lord and everything like that. And, and it, you know, it's all fun and games until chaos comes knocking at your door, right? And then when chaos comes knocking at your door, you have to ask this question. And the question is, do I really believe this? Do I really believe this? Because we say we believe in the word of God. But sometimes if we say we believe in the word of God, but we live unhappy, miserable, sad, depressed, sorrowful, glum, upset, cheerless, droopy lives, there's a disconnect and I'll never forget, I had to make that decision. And like I said, I, I was a Christian, and, I, and I'm speaking to Christians. You have to ask the decision right now, do you believe the word of God? And, and in my case, if I didn't say yes, 
I was a snake oil salesman. I was, I was preaching lies. I either had to apply it to myself and really believe it, or I was a fake. And so this is, this is really important. You know, when we talk about joy, it's not what you think about yourself or your circumstances, or your relationships, or your money problems, or anything that's going on, because I hear it as a, as a, as a pastor, and, and your, your, your pain is real. We live in a world that's painful. We, don't, we live in a world that is sinful. We live in a world that is fallen. And, and, and no one, at least at this church, has promised you, you know, rainbows and, and bunny rabbits if you become a Christian. The health, wealth, prosperity gospel is a lie. Because if you are a Christian, it says the world's going to, they hated Christ, they're going to hate you if you, if you really are. But, but I, I say this, is do you really believe this? Because it's not what you think about yourself or your circumstances, but what you think about him that counts. Do you trust him? Now, we throw these words around like Christmas, all, I mean, as Christians all the time, trust Jesus. But do you really trust him? Do you really believe? Now, listen, in James it says, be careful, don't believe in God. That's not it, because even the demons believe in God and tremble. It's not about believing in God, it's believing God. His revelation, what he says, his word Martin Lloyd-Jones, I, I like to read him. He's a dead guy. Um, great preacher, all right? But listen, he says, you must preach Scripture to your heart every day. Do you hear what I just said? You must preach Scripture to your heart every day. We have a heart problem, and we need Scripture. What we've done is we're not preaching Scripture to our heart. We're actually listening to our hearts. That's a dangerous game. I don't want, I tell your heart to shut up. All right? All right, now I, I'm, not, I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying that your feelings don't matter. I'm saying that your heart needs a steady diet of truth. And your heart needs a steady diet of scripture. Because if you are going to follow your heart, and, and there's, some, there's some pastors who will even say this, oh, uh, the, the Lord put on my heart to, they, you guys don't want to hear from my heart. You want to hear from Scripture. And, and this is really important because we now are listening to how we feel. And I hear it all the time. My feeling this and I'm feeling this and I'm unhappy in this circumstances and I'm not happy in this and, and this is bothering me and this and this and this and this. Do you believe the word of God or not? Because sooner or later it's going to come down where everything, and I tell you, everything can be taken away in like that. And when everything is taken away, what are you going to stand on? Your feelings? Your heart? Or this solid word of God? And I, and I think joy comes from believing the word. Listening to what God says. Now most people, if we go back to the definition, joy is about performance. And in the world, it's about what I do, what I can get, what I possess, what I can hold, what I can buy. And this has to be completely turned around because your joy, and you've tried it, I know you have, I, if I get this, this will make me joyful or happy or content or well-being or prospect of getting what I desire. And you get it. And once you get it, what happens? That wasn't it. So I need to go another thing, and then I get another thing, and if I get this relationship, if I get this house, if I get this car, if I get this education, if I do this and this, and we run around looking for grasping things to obtain things by performance, and it leaves us empty. It's a bucket with a hole in it, and it only leads to frustration. So joy, and this is it. Joy will be three things. First thing is who he is what he's done, and what he, will he do. See, there can be no joy without understanding of God. And it has to be completely independent from everything else. 
Not your circumstances, not your relationships, not your performance, not your worldly success. Your joy is found by God. Now, interesting, you know, um, the, Jesus sent out his disciples and there were 70 of them and they went out with great power, right? And, and they came back and they were just all excited. They were like, even the demons, they obey me. He goes, don't be rejoice about that. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. Don't get all excited about what you can do. You have to get excited about what he, who he is, what he did, and what he's going to do. So let me just, let me just say, first of all, and I didn't, I didn't take the verse, but in, in Nehemiah 8.10, it says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Not your joy, his joy. And guess what? The God of the Bible is very joyful because there's nothing that can stop him. He does what he wants to do. And this is when we talk about the sovereignty of God. Now, does God get troubled? No. Does he get anxious? Does he get worried? Does he fear? And I can go on. No, God is perfect. He's all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, sovereign. And what I just read in, in, in Isaiah says his kingdom and his government will be everlasting. He rules when he ascend, before he ascended into heaven. He says, all power and authority has been given to me. Go and baptize and go and be my disciples. But he has all the authority. The most important thing in your life, especially about joy, is who do you think God is? That's so important. Because if you believe that God is in control, no matter what happens, you can be okay. There's a peace that passes all understanding. There's a joy that comes in the morning. Why? Because I remember that time that I was, I, I didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. I didn't even know what was going to happen two seconds from now. But God did. And God had made promises. And God's word is true. And I went inside and I fell asleep. You know why? Because he's watching. He keeps watch. See, understanding the attributes of God is the greatest gift you could ever have. What you think about is God is important. If you need a miracle in your relationships, in your life, do you know that our God does miracles? Beyond your thoughts, beyond your control, beyond whatever you could ever do. That's the God of the Bible. He loves to do miracles, especially in hopeless cases. If you're hopeless, you're ready for God. What has he done? This good heavenly father, what has he done? He's proven his love. And we read this last week. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He saw us in our sin. He saw us in our misery. He saw us in our separation. He saw us in our death. And he said, I have this issue because I'm a righteous God and, I, and I'm a good God. Something has to happen because they can't get back to me. And I really desire a relationship with them. But I'm just. So what does he do? Christmas. That's what he does. He sends his son as the incarnate God, God with us, to solve the problem. And, and if, you, if you go back and, and read this, he sends the savior of our soul. If you look at Isaiah chapter 9 again. For to us a child is born to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He has the power, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. That's Christmas in your life. John says his joy is complete. He must increase. I must decrease. And let's get this straight. 
your joy can't be your joy. Because if it's truly going to be joy, it's got to be about who? Jesus. Knowing him more, that your children know him more, that you're in the word more, that you're practicing more, that you're, you're testifying more, that you're, you're explaining more. It's more about him. He gets all the glory. It's not what, it sounds crazy, but the emotion of joy should be that Jesus has success on earth, that he's having good fortune, that he, he possesses what one desires. It's all about him. If you make your joy about yourself, you will be unhappy, miserable, sad, depressed, sorrowful, glum, upset, cheerless, and droopy. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. The... And, and Jesus is interesting because although he is God, God the Father was there, right? And, and he prayed to God the Father, and he saw God the Father, and he grew in obedience to God the Father. And, and if you look at Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to see something really interesting. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. I'm sorry, that's wrong. I did it again. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, but I, I think I, oh, no, I did it wrong. Sorry. Well, Melly said she's going to start checking them, so. I know you did last week and there wasn't a problem. All right, chapter 12, verse 2. All right, I did it on the board, good. Or did you just do it for me? All right, thank you, Anna. All right, look, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God, uh, the right hand of the throne of God. This is really cool because seeing the joy set before him, he went to the cross. See, we have to have a different perspective because our joy's not here. We're citizens of another place. We're going to eternity. And in eternity, there's going to be dancing and joy everlasting. Yes, I know that here it's a, a tears, and, 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 but this is just a, a blink of an eye compared to eternity with Christ. If we understand that there's something after this, you know, we've made Christianity... So materialistic in the sense of cause and effect of this world. And it's only about joy found here. Real Christianity has nothing to do with joy found here. It has to do with an eternity of joy. So who is God? What has he done in Christ Jesus? And, and, and finally, what will he do? Listen, we have the promise. Jesus, this guy I read, the wonderful counselor, mighty, mighty God, everlasting. Listen, he promised, I will never leave or forsake you. In your, prom, in your problem right now, you can say, I am going to stand on the word of God right now. I'm not alone, and this is true. This is true. And he won't leave me or forsake me. He's in control. He's a sovereign God. He's all powerful. He can do the miracle that I need. He's, he, all things work for good for those who love him. And that's not saying that all things are good, but all things will work for good. I can trust him. Just as Christ trusted him as he went to the cross. This is exciting. If we could grasp who he is, what he has done, and what he will do. Listen, he gives us the Holy Spirit, which is like the seal of assurance. Assurance should bring us joy. No one can take you out of my hand, he says. You're safe. No matter what happens, God is going to do what he does best. And he's going to save. And you will make it home. No matter what. And, and Paul understands this. He says, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? You die. And he goes, for me... That's gain, because I'm going right up where? To heaven. But we hold so tight to the stupid joys of this world, like it's something to be grasped on and to hold on to. And we know the ending. He comes back for us, and he takes us home. He defeats and vindicates 
He defeats evil and vindicates us and brings us into this joy, this new Jerusalem where there's no more crying, no more tears. So that brings me to part two. I don't even know what time it is. But that brings me to part two. How do we live in this joy? We need, we need a God perspective. Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 says, says, rejoice always in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Not rejoice, but in the Lord. Rejoice. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Now, this is a commandment, right? Just like any other commandments. He says rejoice in the Lord, and he says it again. Always, I say it again, rejoice. Now, if I took a snapshot or an Instagram of your faces right now, then don't look too rejoicing. And it's really important because, and, and, I, and I, I'll put myself first, right? You know, my father used to say, what's the matter with your face? All right? What's the matter with your face? Because I walked around like I had the weight of the world on my shoulders. Like I was droopy. You know, my, nothing's working out. I'm unhappy and I'm unmiserable and I'm sad and I'm depressed and I'm sorrowful and I'm glum. I'm just droopy. If you, if you go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, if you go to verse 3, right above it, and I, I didn't give it to Anna, but if you go to verse 3, that's why i got to bring your Bibles. Verse 3, right above it. Look what it says. He, and he's talking about rejoicing, right? In, in verse 4, in verse 3, it says... Um, Help these women who have labored by my side, each of the gospel together, the Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Hmm. Whose names are in the book of life. And then he jumps into rejoice and rejoice always. Now, this is the crazy part about it. By the foundation of the world, he wrote your name in a book. And that book does not change. No matter what happens here on this earth, no matter what you go through, no matter the pain, the sorrow, nothing. That book cannot be changed. That is where your joy comes from. Not in the circumstances of this world, but that you are known by God. And what he started in you, he will finish. You know, there's, there's, there's part of me that, that would love just to say, listen, be joyful. But that's behaviorism, right? <laughs> you ever get so tired of smiling when you don't want to smile? Right? We're not asking that. I'm saying, know who God is. Know what God's done in Jesus Christ and know what he's promised in your life. This is Christmas 24-7. Work it out in your life. I, there's sometimes I talk to, to marriage couples and, and, and they're both Christians and I just want to say, hey, work it out. Repent and believe in the gospel. Come together. It's not you winning. It's not you winning. It's joy in that Christ gets all the glory through our relationship. This is important stuff because what does it, you know, if we, we well, let me, I don't know if I'm getting any better at this because Lexi, Lexi calls me grumpy bear. There's, we, you know, remember those sunshine bears? What, care bears? Remember care bears? Well, we have a pink care bear and we have a blue care bear. Right? Guess who is the pink care bear? Chair bear. Cheer bear. Melly. I'm the grumpy bear. All right? What's the matter with my face? That, it's a good question. Because when the world sees you, when the world looks at you and you're walking around droopy, what does that say about your heavenly father? What does that say about Christmas? What does that say about your relationship with the Lord and your hope? What does it say about your testimony? And, and like I said, I'm grumpy bear. 
And I used, to, I used to say, well, I can't see, and so I'm scowling because I, I don't have my glasses. But then I got glasses, and I had no more excuse. So I, I get back to the, the main point. Do you truly believe in the Word of God? So I, 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 picked, I tried to do something crazy. I picked the most famous verse or famous portion of the Bible to see if you really believe it. What is the... The, other than John 3.16, what's that one psalm that everyone knows? Psalm what? 23. All right, let's go to Psalm 23. Everyone knows it, right? But let's go to Psalm 23 because you might know it. I want to know if you believe it. All right, I want to see, I want to see if you believe it. Psalm 23. And it's short. We're going to do the whole thing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now listen, do you, do you believe that? That he will provide for you whatever you need, you will not be in want. That should take away fear and that should take away anxiety if you believe the 23rd Psalm. He makes me lie down in green pastures, peace and tranquility. He'll give you a peace that passes all understanding. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He will take care of you because it says something about himself. You're his. He's your heavenly father. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, pastor. You don't know how dark my shadow is. All right. No sunlight. It's bad. It's dark. Look what he says. I will fear no evil. Why? Because he knows who God is, he knows what God did, and he knows what God is going to do. I will not fear because you are what? With me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You'll protect me. You'll provide for me. And then it goes even crazier. It changes metaphors. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Nothing can harm you. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Do you believe that? If you do, if you do believe that, and, and, and Paul got this. Paul was imprisoned when he wrote, rejoice, always rejoice. He had just gotten beaten, and now he's in prison. Because he knew that the word of God was being moved by him him preaching. It, it wasn't about him. It wasn't about John. And I'm going to tell you right now, your joy is not about you. It's about believing what God is doing. People have to see us. And, and, you know, this is where testimony comes into play. People have to see you and they have to see my face. And they shouldn't say, what's the matter with that guy's face? They should say, why is that guy smiling in the middle of problems? And I'll tell you, when, when I was going through the tough time and I decided to actually believe the word of God, people would come to me and say, how can you relax when everything's going crazy? And I'd just say, God's in control. God knows. I trust him. I have to. And it changes the entire dynamic. Your mind is set, if your mind is set on earthly things, what happens when all the earthly things fall apart? But the Lord has come, Emmanuel. We're not still waiting for Jesus to come. He came. He, in Philippians, it keeps on talking about if, if you have this. He says, you shouldn't feel any anxiety. It says, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. And if you studied in, in the summertime over contentment and studied with Melly and it was the women's over contentment and, and, and complaining and anxiety about anything, and this is a command, again, don't be anxious. What does anxiety say about your heavenly father? It says you either don't trust him or he doesn't have the power to do what he says he's going to do. Do you believe that the reality of what we're talking about is the word of God? Now, some of you, and I can go through the list, are angry and anxious and bitter. And during Christmas time even, unhappy, miserable, sad, depressed, sorrowful, glum, upset, cheerless, and droopy. And you might be like me and have a problem with your face. 
I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, the only thing I can say to you is get into the word and find out who your God really is. Find out what he's done in and through Jesus Christ on your behalf and, and, and understand the promises of the Holy Spirit in your life right now. Get in the word and believe it and trust it. Now we've been singing joy to the world and joy of the Lord and, and preach the scriptures to your heart. Tell your heart to shut up. I, I, tell your heart to shut up. Don't follow your heart Follow his word. Know God and the one whom he sent. And I, I just want to end again because we got the time, I guess. J just to read uh, Isaiah chapter 9 again. And I'm not even going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read from verse 6 on. For to us a child is born. To us a son and given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. Today is Christmas. That God, Emmanuel, is with you today. The question is, will we believe it? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. And Lord, we, we are just filled with joy. We're filled with joy because we, we're okay. Because our success is found in you and our fortune is found in you and our riches are found in you and, and we have possessed all things we desire, which is you. Lord, forgive us because we've been unhappy, complaining, miserable, sad, depressed, sorrowful, glum, and droopy sons and daughters because we have not realized who you are and all your attributes, your power and your might and your sovereignty. We, we, we don't focus on what you've done as proof to, of your love for us in Christ Jesus and the redemption and the salvation of our souls, Lord. And Lord, we take every promise now and we hold it tight to our chest, Lord, that we would live in your promises, that you love us, that you will never leave or forsake us, that, that all things work for good, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, and that you were, will be with us for the end of the, until the ends of the world. Lord, help us to rejoice. Help us that our whole being would change, that we would see you in our circumstances and smile. That in midst of the tears, Lord, we would find a peace that passes all understanding and smile. And even in the shadow of death, Lord, that we would see your coming glory and smile. God, you change everything. Rejoice. Rejoice, O oh people of God. Amen. So as the, the guys come up, we'll, we'll practice our, our Holy Communion as we usually do. And, and this is a means of grace that God has given to us. And, and it should teach us about what I just spoke about. It should teach us that we are covered by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It should teach us that by the ingestion of the elements that inside of us, that we are his and he, he is ours and, and nothing can separate us. Paul says when you come to the table... Uh, make sure that you uh, examine yourselves. Not that you're perfect, but that you have asked for forgiveness and found forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And if you've done that, then come and partake with us. We're going to have a time of worship, a time of examination, and then we'll partake together. Just blood has left me.
night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread together. And after that, on the same night, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup for the forgiveness of sins. This is the victory cup, my blood given for you. This is the joyous cup of our forgiveness. Let us partake of this together. Now receive the benediction. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be with us till we meet again in joy and wonder. Amen.